Nothing. That's typical lately. All right, uh, here we are in a pretty cool place here in Ottawa, Canada called the Brass Monkey. We played here a few times. It's a really nice place. Friends of ours own it and uh, we come here to relax sometimes and have a good meal and play some pool and sometimes when we're in town. 2017. We are currently Jeff Waters on lead vocals and guitars. We've got Back right there, Aaron Hama on guitars. Back left, we got Richard Hinks from the UK. We got new drummer Fabio from Italy, Fabio Alessandrini from Bologna, near Bologna. Um, so this is our current lineup. I met, uh, this is the first guy, Aaron. I met a couple of years, what, a year and a half ago? I joined in right at the beginning of 2015, in January. I opened my Facebook inbox one day and there was a message from Jeff asking if I'd be interested in jamming with him and auditioning for the band. Uh, he had gotten my information from a uh, promoter manager from Montreal where I was living at the time and uh, it was, who was a mutual friend of both of us and then I came and jammed with him and it was really good. When I was uh, a young boy, I actually, when I was 15 years old, I moved from Toronto, Ontario, Canada to Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And I started getting connected to people and other musicians in town via the Ottawa Metal Forums. And I don't even think that the forum exists anymore, but at the time it was like where every musician communicated. And guys were showing me good guitar players and uh, they said that there was a band from Ottawa called Annihilator. I never heard of them until this point. And then they sent me uh, one of those video compilations of basically all the solos from the latest album. And I was just totally blown away. I couldn't believe there was a band so technical from Ottawa. We've got back here, Rich Hinks joined the band last year or so for a summer fest, no, headline tour that we did. I think it was the first uh, headline tour for our record, Suicide Society. Um, I think it started in September 2015 and uh, last minute our bass player that was going to tour with us at the time had a family emergency and at the very last minute we got Rich, very lucky, went right away over after rehearsals to the UK, started our tour and uh, he's decided to keep on with us. I got involved with Annihilator when they were holding open auditions. I saw on their Facebook page um, that they were looking for a bass player. Sound like Gene Simmons. And being from England, I sort of thought, well, it's, it's pretty unlikely seeing as they're all the way over there, but I know they do lots of European tours, and that's where a lot of the fans are, um, me being one of them, of course. Um, so I sort of thought, well, I might as well give it a go. So I sent in um, some videos on YouTube, did it that way, um, as it was an open audition, anyone could apply. And then I heard back three days before the, the I think it was a six-week European tour was supposed to start. Three days before that, I heard back saying, oh, can you do this tour? So I had, th I had three days to learn the whole set list. I mean, lots of them I already knew, being a fan of the band, so it wasn't amazingly impossible, but it was a lot of work. Um, and then I flew over to Canada to rehearse for a couple of weeks, and that was the first time I met Jeff, was arriving at his house in a taxi. I first heard Annihilator back in, I think it was 2005, um, when I was about this big, uh, <laughs> um, when their Schizo Deluxe album was first coming out. And I remember hearing that and thinking, 
wow, this is really cool, really heavy um, and fast as well. Because at that time, I, I, I'd sort of just discovered a few years before, like Metallica, Megadeth, Anthrax, Slayer, all those bands. Um, and I was looking for some more things in that vein and Annihilator really fit the bill. So back in 2005 was the first time I heard the band. And the first time I saw them was actually in 2007 when they came to England and they came to Cambridge, which is where I live in England. And that was the first time I saw them. It was the European tour with Trivium actually. Um, and it was great. I remember just absolutely loving the show. Fabio Alessandrini from outside Bologna, Italy, is our new drummer. Fantastic, amazing kid. And I gotta say, there's no drummer, and that means any drummer that's been in the band. And we've had some unbelievably great drummers. Randy Black, Mike Mangini, Ray Hartman, lots of great players. Um, but this guy, Fabio, uh, was the first guy to have it kind of down and ready to roll within about four rehearsals. We've never had that before. I joined the band uh, on the very last days of March uh, 2016. After talking via emails with Jeff and sending him a few videos of me playing uh, Annihilator songs, and when he answered me, I literally couldn't believe it. So I'm so excited about this. This is like a dream come true. I first heard of the band when I was 17. A friend of mine called Leo went to me and said, you gotta check out this band, you gotta listen to this record. And then he put Alice in L. And when the second song, the bass line started, I was literally blown away and I was like, this is so tight, and this was recorded in 1989. And I was like, man, I will listen to this until I die. I first met uh, Jeff at the airport after a 15 hours flight, and he picked me up uh, with his Camaro. And that was so surreal. I was like, oh my God, I've only uh, seeing this man on records and videos, like he's a legend and he's picking me up. So I was like, this is a dream. I almost had to punch me to think, is this real? A great band. I guess I mean I love the band. They just have such great energy. I mean I think I met Jeff in early '93. He uh, I got the opportunity of singing backgrounds along with Dave Steele on Phoenix Rising, and uh, got to work with him back in '93. And then I did another album, Angel Eyes. Angel Eyes yes, which I sang on myself. I think in 2013, and I feel really happy, you know, quite uh, uh, fantastic about the fact that he asked me to come and do this acoustic project. It's a, a definite honor. I met Jeff uh, through a music store I work at, and uh, that was a long time ago. God, you know, I've known Jeff a long time now, and. Uh, yeah, we just met uh, through the store and then eventually became friends. And, and I think our big, uh, I mean all kinds of music, I think the one that uh, Jeff and I really uh, have in common is we're both Eddie Van Halen fans. <laughs> so that kind of brought us together, I think, uh, in many ways. Well, when I think of Jeff Waters um, as a guitar player, you know, other than just amazing, uh, uh, two things come to mind, I think. Um, one is his timing. You know, no matter how fast he's playing or for how long, um, his timing is just impeccable. And then the second thing would be really the clarity of his notes. I mean, again, even when he's playing super fast and a lot of notes,
for a long period of time. You know, everyone is articulated and is just really clear and spot on. He's, he's just got incredible timing and clarity. So the first time that I heard Annihilator, I think it was 1989, and me and Nick Menza and Marty Friedman would listen to the Alice in Hell record, driving to and from rehearsal all the time. We were basically writing the Rust in Peace record, essentially first me and Nick, and then once Marty joined the band in early 1990, we'd listen to it all the time. Jeff's guitar playing is incredible. Alice in Hell was a, was, was, was a dear record to me, still is. I love to listen to it every chance that I can. I must say, uh, one of my favorite songs is Annihilator one. Uh, Fun Palace, I like the fucking riff because it's. I try to fucking play it and I, I'm not able to, so it's. You know, you're a fucking wizard, I know that. His right hand is faster than most. Uh, I remember seeing him at the NAM show where he was putting on a guitar clinic and across the way Kerry King was doing a clinic and Jeff's right hand, um, I'll tell you what, Kerry, uh, Kerry did not win that right hand battle that night. Jeff's great thing is like he has a fantastic right hand for rhythm and everything. Yeah, but this is a left hand problem. And he's also a fantastic <laughs> left hand. The most, yeah. most, uh, most guitarists can do either. Like you can, they're great rhythm guitar players, but they're not good at leads. Chef has definitely a very unique style, and uh, he can mm -hmm. do both. And that's that's not so often in metal that somebody has this unique style and has both the picking and also the shredding. I think we don't have to talk about Jeff's guitar abilities. He's one of the greatest guitar players in the world, I guess. What I like most about the music is that the riffs have a certain energy to them all the time and a certain shape. What that means is that there's a certain cadence um, and combining that with an energy level, it makes you kind of want to hit stuff. And as a drummer, that's just what I like to do. You know, Annihilator really is kind of one of an extension of my opinion of, you know, the thr they're Canada's thrash, thrash band, you know. Um, kind of an extension of the big four. So we have Sepultura in the south, we have Annihilator to the north, and uh, just one of, one of the pack, one of the tribe. So the thing I've always liked the best about Jeff Waters' is riffs is the originality of it. I love his uh, perfect combination of classic thrash and heavy metal prog and also great pop sensibilities. Plus, I love Jeff Waters' solos. Uh, very intricate, but very memorable, very melodic. Um, you can sing the solos. It was a very Randy Rhodes-esque quality, a very um, Eddie Van Halen type of a quality to all of Jeff's work. He's also a quite entertaining guy. I mean, we've done a couple of interviews and he's telling me hilarious things. Uh, and we, I, I printed in them all. He's a great showman live. Very fun to watch playing. And uh, like I said, couldn't be a nicer guy either. So very quirky, as you can imagine. After being in rock and roll for 30 odd years, you gotta be a little quirky, gotta be a little, uh, little nutty. Um, you know, actually, the best story that I remember about the Annihilator is like our very first big American tour with the Chromax. And uh, we were touring the States in 87, I think. And the first Annihilator album came out at the time, and we played it constantly in our vans. Right? Totally true. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was Dream Theater at the time, the first mm -hmm. album, and the Annihilator album, and we loved the record. We were playing it on and on and on. Yeah. And uh, later on, when we met Chef the first time, it was like cool because he's like, oh, I like destruction, I, I grew up in destruction. And then he came to the show in uh, Vancouver, that's Vancouver? I think it's Vancouver. Think so, yeah. And he brought us to a strip club to eat some burgers. That was, I would, I would never forget that. I never had strip club at a burger. Uh, and, uh, the other way around, I never had burgers at the strip club. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was a little obscure for a European. It's kind of weird, you know? Whenever we meet, there's it's so much fun, and uh, even in front of uh, the camera, he's quite spontaneous. We're here in a place called Dunrobin, very close to where I live, extremely meters away. And there's a uh, there's some wild animals that live here that are very dangerous. You get a stick to hit it to subdue the beast. It's a wild Camaro. Who knew? <laughs> Whoa.
Well, it's uh, as I'm shooting this, it's 2016 summer. It might not come out till 2017, I think, this whole DVD thing. And on the left, my left, that way, is uh, the area where I you know, kind of grew up for about 10 years uh, through childhood sailing and uh, windsurfing. Uh, through my father, he was uh, an incredible, avid sailor and uh, windsurfer. And uh, so we had lots of boats, catamarans, uh, hobby, hobby cats, hobby cats, uh, aqua cats, uh, like leisurely catamarans and racing catamarans, as well as other sailboats from, again, pleasure craft to uh, fast sailboats. And so we got a bit of that in. I wasn't very good at it, but my dad taught me a bit and it was a lot of fun. But this is the um, Ottawa River and um, we had a cottage there. When I was young, we used to come out every weekend in the you know late spring uh, until maybe first week of September, and uh, it was it was what a great life it was. Um, then I moved out to Vancouver when I was in 1987. I think I was uh, 21 years old, and that's where I wanted to you know make my my band uh, happen. You know, I'd already had an Isleter uh, 84, 85, 86 here in Ottawa, but I wanted to um, you know, find other musicians, and there was a bigger music scene in Vancouver. So I left for Vancouver, thinking that, oh no, this is it's probably not going to be as nice as it is out here. And I was I was actually happily wrong. Vancouver is one of the most uh, paradised type places in the world um, for many reasons, and it doesn't get super cold in the winter like it does in the the middle or east of Canada. But uh, after many years out in Vancouver just skipping ahead with the music stuff, many albums, many, you know, adventures, good and bad. I ended up uh, moving back in 2003 to Ottawa and uh, needed help uh, with uh, my son to take care of him while I was gone on tours. Uh, and I couldn't leave him by himself and it was getting expensive and just not right for him to, to leave him with babysitters and, and that. So. I figured I'd make the move back to Ottawa, where I grew up, and uh, leave beautiful Vancouver behind. However, as you can maybe see from these clips, it's uh, extremely beautiful in Ottawa. Uh, I'm, I'm actually outside of Ottawa in a place called Dunrobin. It's about 45 minutes out of the city. Um, and it's uh, called the Ottawa River, and it goes all the way down to the famous Parliament buildings that you see on the tourist advertisements. Uh, but uh, it's just paradise here. But it's also hell. In the winter time, this is one of the most hellish places you can be. It gets up to plus 40 Celsius in the summer, and it gets easily to minus 40 Celsius in the winter. So this is uh, the best of both worlds here. Best of the best and worst. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm happy to be back here. I sure miss Vancouver, and I actually wish I could retire or, or move to Kelowna or back to the British Columbia province, Vancouver area someday and we'll see what happens with that but not complaining with weather like this and with you know living where I'm living in the area and the house and everything else so it's a good life definitely a good life in Canada we have uh, similar problems as many of you have in your countries most of you uh, drugs uh, you name it there's 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 issues with every country but in general as many people already know Canada is uh, one of the better comp er, companies, countries for the least amount of crime and the least real major problems in life, the clean air and it's hard to say that though because as much as we're ranked high up on the list, there's still poverty, there's still uh, you know so many social issues to deal with and, and the environment and everything else. But I can honestly say that living in Canada is fantastic after traveling the world. It's a great place to live. Well, here we are at uh, literally 300 meters from where my house is now, uh, but behind me is um, 300 meters away I live. But this is the house that, uh, the, the place where I uh, kind of grew up when I was talking about going sailing with my father and uh, actually having some real cool parties here when I was a teenager. I worked as a dishwasher uh, at a restaurant called Casey's at the time. And uh, I was one of the youngest people on the staff and there was a, of course a lot of uh, waitresses and college students and waiters and they were, you know, 17 to 23 and a lot of hot waitresses. So I thought I would uh, 
and I wasn't the cool guy, I was just a young kid in the, washing dishes, 16 year old or whatever I was. But uh, I offered up to them to have their yearly staff party at my parents' cottage here, which is back right there. And uh, I didn't ask my parents, I just uh, told the boss, yeah, my parents will have no problem with that. So I, I, when I finally told my parents that we're gonna have a big party up here in the summer, uh, instead of telling me, uh, getting angry, and, well, they were a little bit angry at first, but they, they said it was okay. And my father came up the entire time, it took uh, all the pretty waitresses sailing. Um, and uh, we just took over the place, built a big fire pit right here. Uh, and it was fantastic. We had, I don't know, 100 people here and it was just so many, so many memories here, you know, bringing band members, musicians, you know, uh, girlfriends, uh, just having a blast up here. Good parties. But now it's changed a bit. Uh, they built, instead of cottages, they built these beautiful houses along the water. Um, and it's just really cool to visit it. What I didn't bank on or, or guess or could never have dreamed that when I left for Vancouver in 1987 and said, see everybody, I'm gonna make my fame and fortune and play my music in Vancouver um, and probably live there for the rest of my life in paradise. Uh, I never thought that I would be back here and living a few hundred meters from where I grew up at the cottage. So it's pretty cool for me. Uh, this is a place called Constance Bay, which is uh, just across the water from where I live. And uh, as you can see over there, the, the small mountains, uh, at the bottom of them you can see a, where it gets green, a lot of trees and that. That's actually Quebec, the province, the French province of Quebec. We are in the uh, province of Ontario. But that's, uh, this river called the Ottawa River is the dividing line between the two provinces. Um, but anyway, this is really cool. It's like. Uh, there should be thousands of people here, but there never is. There's one little um, sort of bar and uh, food, small restaurant here. Um, nice clean beach, lots of boats. Not today, but there's usually lots of boats, sailboats, motorboats, and uh, just local people here. And it's, it's kind of like an undiscovered uh, area outside of Ottawa. Um, so it's awesome. So we sneak here every, time, every chance we can get. Right now we're just taking, you can see over there, you can see the guys they're all scared, right? We've got Fabio in the middle from Italy. We've got Rich from England. Uh, and Aaron is on the left. But the two guys to the right, I don't know if they've ever seen a beach. I mean, they're from the UK and, and Italy. Oh, that's right. Some of the most beautiful be beaches are in the Mediterranean. Okay, all right. But uh, they're just deciding whether they want to go in the water, I guess. We're just taking a break from rehearsal. Going to get some cheeseburgers and hanging out here on the beach and whatever. We love you. See ya. I think any band has a different approach uh, when it comes to rehearse or practice on songs. Some bands may run into the whole set list, even though someone make a mistake, it doesn't matter for them. But with this band, uh, we really like to focus on each part that can be wrong and work on that. So every member of the band can uh, work even by himself on that part so we get tighter every time I play well when we're playing live I just play all the songs I play all the tunes I play all the parts that are hardest the most technical parts and I do it every day I do it even when we're not playing so I just do my normal regimen of playing about eight hours of guitar a day and then um, on and off you know and then I go out there and I just try to play the songs as tight as I can uh, and I only practice parts that I have a hard time with because I want to get better. The special thing for me about working with Annihilator is 
the fact that I've listened to the band for so many years and I have this attachment to it and I have memories connected to Annihilator and the music. So coming here and playing these songs for me is, firstly it's a little bit surreal because it's like, oh I can't believe I'm actually playing these songs, um, which is really cool. But um, yeah, it, it, it's just a great feeling getting to play with this band and, and, and everyone gets along, we all have fun which is one of the main things we're doing music. If you're not enjoying it, then, you know, the music's not gonna be as good. So it's just a great vibe. When I was really young, when I was four years old, and I'm 28 right now, so this is a, a long time ago, 24 years ago, 23 years ago-ish, uh, I went to a big carnival, and it was the coolest carnival ever. It was in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, at what was called at the time the Sky Dome, which is the huge arena, and it's got a roof that actually retracts and opens, which is kind of why it was called the Sky Dome. And uh, my aunt and my uncle were visiting from Vancouver, and they took me to this carnival, um, and we won a ton of prizes, and one of those prizes was a, a totally crappy guitar. And uh, it was probably the most life-changing moment for me because after that day, I just held on to that thing every second I could and one of my earliest memories is is playing guitar in a in a wig of long hair at the vacuum cleaner at the at the push vacuum cleaner and uh, I was I would always sing and play guitar it, obviously just total nothingness I was just hitting the guitar and screaming probably but that's what it was all about for me I just wanted I, I would set up actually all my all my stuffed animals as a crowd and I would play for the stuffed animals and I had to be head banging and running around and that's just what I've always wanted to do, you know. I remember myself uh, when I was a kid uh, pretending to be uh, a crazy drummer, picking up toys and whatever that reminded me of drumsticks or stuff and I was pretending to be a drummer. The key moment the moment in which I realized I wanted to be a musician, I wanted to be a drummer. Uh, I think that happened when I was 10 or something and I was uh, looking at an MTV video with my mom and there was uh, this drummer doing drumsticks and stuff. I can't remember exactly what the video was but I remember me and my mom watching each other and saying uh, is that what you want to do? And I was like, yeah, my eyes were shining. So after that, I started taking drum lessons and that's it. That's what I am right now. I'm a drummer. When I was about four or five, I first started learning to play piano and alto saxophone, actually, believe it or not. Um, and that was my first experience with music. And then I was sort of fairly into it, but um, it wasn't sort of 100% and then when I discovered some music that I actually really, really loved, um, which first started with thrash metal and then all sorts of subgenres, progressive metal, death metal, all this sort of stuff, um, then that made me want to pick up bass and guitar, which I picked up both at the same time actually when I was, I think I was around 13 when I first started bass and guitar um, and it's just sort of ballooned from there and grown and grown um, into recording um, playing live, doing all, all, all sorts of things, really. As a warm-up routine, I completely follow the Jimmy Oglan routine on his DVD. Uh, which is actually talking about, before playing, doing a lot of paradiddles with hands on a pad and stretching muscles, stretching muscles of your hands, stretching muscles of your feet. It's really important to have all the muscles relaxed and maybe jamming to some famous tunes or doing 16th notes with feet and drinking coffee, drinking a lot of water. I don't really have any rituals before a show other than warming up, making sure I'm all sort of stretched and ready to go, um, warming up my hands and my voice, and that's about it really. 
Jeff and me are always scrambling before the show starts, usually about 15 to 10 minutes before we go on stage. We're just, we're just looking everywhere for the closest cup of coffee. And we just swig that back, cheers, we all props, we get ready and we go out there and we just decimate. But that coffee is extremely essential. And if anyone's seen me and Jeff, or Jeff and I, I should say, proper grammar, at any of the festivals or any shows or on the, any of the cruises or anything, we're always holding the coffee because that is just the, that's the nature's nectar, is coffee. You can really see the influences that he has from Iron Maiden to Metallica to Slayer to Van Halen to ACDC. It's all in there and just shows that um, the songs um, have all the elements that they need to be a great song. And also, um, his uh, guitar playing, his solo guitar playing is really fantastic, I think, because um, I don't think many thrash guitarists can pull something off like he does by playing uh, aggressive, super fast solos and still make them super melodic and catchy. That's what's lacking in a lot of thrash bands, I think. And also a huge part of every metal band are the live performances and it doesn't matter which lineup he's played in, all the live performances I've seen them play were absolutely fantastic and he always chooses great set lists with um, deep cuts and also plays quite uh, long set lists. For example, I saw them a few years ago in Germany and he played for over two hours and I've actually never seen a band play that long. And you just see them on stage and see that they have a lot of fun and just um, the audience picks it up and it's just a super great atmosphere between the band and the, the, the audience and also between the band members, you do, just can see it. And I hope they will play again soon in my area and I hope for the next album. Okay, the first reason that I love Annihilator is because thanks to Annihilator and Jeff uh, I've started to play the guitar because when I've heard first time Annihilator, I fell in love with that music and I've decided that I want to be as cool as Jeff is, but I'll never be that cool. <laughs> uh, so thanks to him I play guitar because, yeah. <laughs> um, the, second, the second reason why I love Annihilator is because... Uh, they saved my life. Um, there were so many times that a lot of people told me that you suck, uh, you'll never reach anything in your life. But not any later. Uh, they were always somewhere there. <laughs> and um, thanks to their music, I've started to believe in myself. So thank you very much. When I was 12 years old, I was introduced to this album uh, that actually blew my mind and changed my life. Uh, I became a musician after that album, so it really influenced me as a musician in metal. Um, what can I say? And I later has an epic career, a phenomenal a catalog from A to Z, from Alice in Hell, like uh, Never Never Land, Set the World of Fire, King of the Kills, blah blah blah, you know, uh, Carnival Diablo, Metal, like uh, all the way, Feast, and uh, Feast was a really good album too, um, I thought it was epic, but something really special happened in 2015 when I heard this album, uh, pfft. It actually blew my mind. I never thought that a band that would have been around for that long would surpass their whole catalog with uh, a new release like that. Uh, it's phenomenal record. It really shines on top. Um, Jeff Waters, thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you did, everything that you gave me, you brought to me, you influenced me. Um, Annihilator is all about pure fucking metal it never choked it never went into another direction it's just been pure metal and it's just phenomenal so thank you so much um i can't wait to hear what you're gonna do in the future uh i know there's much more good music to come along so uh keep it up annihilator metal for life well i first found out about them when i was 12 
years old. I already listened to a lot of Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, and Iron Maiden, and all that kind of stuff. And I was pretty sure that nothing could ever top any of those bands. Um, I also liked excessively rhythm guitar playing, good rhythm guitar playing. So when a friend of mine gave me a cassette of Annihilator's Never Neverland, I believe, and then it was Alice in Hell, and then he gave me another cassette with Set the World on Fire, I was blown away by the level of musicianship and technicality and um, I became a fan overnight and since then, I've, since then I've never stopped listening to the band and everything new that they put out. Uh, I became one of Jeff's greatest fans, I believe. He's one of my uh, very... Uh, he's one of my favorite guitar players ever, both rhythm and lead. And uh, to me, Annihilator is the perfect combination of different elements in their music with their own style and sound that nobody can copy ever. Because uh, we all know that Annihilator, if they want to, they can sound like many bands. And they've done it uh, just for, fi for fun, for kicks. But no other band uh, can ever sound like Annihilator. And I believe, honestly, I believe that Jeff is an alien who came down to this earth just, just to teach us how good music is made and um, help our minds get more creative by um, giving us all those beautiful melodies and rhythms and grooves and all that kind of stuff. So I urge you to keep listening to Anna later and I hope the band keeps rocking the stages and gives us more studio albums for the following 100, 100 years, I don't know as much as Jeff can cope with it. Hi there, Annihilator! First of all, I want to apologize for my bad English. My name is Vlad Posnikov and I live in uh, Ukraine, in Donetsk. There is a woman here, so maybe you heard about this place. Actually, Annihilator's Hell is a word describes what's going on. In my humble opinion, Annihilator is a very kick-ass band in the world but very underrated band. You always give me a strength to move forward. The group has changed many styles, but the core of the group has always been a one man, which is incredible Jeff Waters. So cool guitar player, so freaking great guy, a real icon. For me, he stands with a James Hetfield and Joe Satriani, always in a great sense of humor. Jeff, why do you still haven't participated in a G3 or Metal Masters? So bad that your concert in the summer, or more precisely in the fall, in Moscow, was cancelled. It's not so easy to visit shows in this darkness time for us. But we doesn't despair. There's YouTube, where we can see all your powerful stuff. I love this group, because it combines intelligence, jazz, but aggressive, trash styles of music. The concentrated punch in the face. I don't know much the language because of practice, but I understand the lyrics of songs is social and relevant. So, Annihilator, you are the best! Please, do show as often as possible. Produce for fans some studio gems, rare demos and concert DVDs in a Blu-ray 5D multi-angle editions. With love, from Donetsk. Alright, here we are, beautiful Ottawa, Canada. I have some questions that need to be answered from our fans on our website and Facebook and all that stuff. Question from Jamie Bennett in Canada, right here in beautiful Canada. Do I have any strong Canadian influences that come into the Annihilator songwriting? Yes, I have, uh, of course, the obvious ones, the, the, the Bay Area thrash stuff and some UK heavy metal, Priest, Maiden, just so many bands. But also there are, you know, at least three or maybe more, Exciter, Anvil, Razor, for example, were big influences in the mid 80s to, uh, and earlier 80s to the writing that I was to do with Annihilator. Um, Definitely Razor, first couple, all these bands, Exciter, Razor, Anvil had very classic uh, second and third, first, second, third albums, um, and those were top of my playlist when I was a teenager, absolutely. I don't know how to say your first name, but you're either Mr. Pinto, Mrs. Pinto, or Miss Pinto. So, Person Pinto, I don't know where you're from because you didn't leave your uh, country, um, is there something outside of metal that I can see myself doing? Well, not at this point in my life, but uh, when I was younger, 
Uh, no. Same thing with that. I, I really didn't have anything I knew how to do or wanted to do outside of music. The only thing, maybe as I look back, is I might have went to school for uh, psychology or something like that related to how the mind works. Because uh, some of you know that uh, the lyrics we have, especially in the earlier days, uh, relate to the mind and the issues and problems and good things and bad things about the mind. Uh, but uh, no, I don't know. I don't think so. I think I'd just be doing something in music if I wasn't with Annihilator. It's in the blood. Ben Gilly from the UK asks if the song Dr. Psycho from our uh, 2004 album All For You, if Dr. Psycho is about a bad experience I may have had uh, with the medical community or a doctor, or if it's based on uh, old horror flicks and, and the latter. Uh, I used to like and still love horror movies, um, and I like the sound effects and the silly cheesy screams and effects that they had in the earlier movies. And you can hear that, I think, in the middle part of the, the song Dr. Psycho, you can hear a little tribute to that. Spencer Coe from the United States of America, and uh, you can't see it now, but directly behind the camera is the mighty United States of America Embassy here in Ottawa. It's a, it's a fortress. It looks amazing. Um, but his question is, what is your favorite and least favorite Annihilator record? Uh, I'm sure, you know, most people have, artists have their favorite and least favorite for sure, but don't like to say what the least favorite is. But I think this, the album Remains that we did in 97, I should say I did because I think I was the, almost the only person on it, uh, was more of a, a time when my writing was negatively affected by the state of the heavy metal and thrash metal industry and uh, what was really going on with the press and the eight clubs, agencies, record companies. Just the state of heavy metal music at the time was pretty crappy. Um, bands like Slayer kept me going through. I would see Slayer in a club when they used to play arenas and that would kind of give me the, the shot in the arm to, to keep going at what I'm doing. But the Remains album was more of a contractual thing to get my deal done with the label and uh, it just was just not done out of love of metal. It was more like a hobby record, a, a solo side project. I enjoyed the record, I loved doing it, but it just wasn't really an Annihilator record. If we put a, uh, a drummer on there, it would have helped. We still do a, one or two songs from that album live. Uh, we've done the song Murder a lot. Uh, now, uh, Tricks and Traps uh, is a normal one in our set now. But uh, in general, if I have to pick one, that's it, remains. Uh, the best one, I think, was, uh, for my opinion, I think, clearly, is Never Never Land. I think that's the peak, the pinnacle of uh, songwriting and also the combination of the four or three or four musicians on that record that really gelled together at that time for that record with those songs. I don't think that could ever be duplicated. Um, and also the most underrated record I'd say was called uh, Schizo Deluxe in 2005. Pick that one up if you haven't heard it because I think Schizo Deluxe was one of the one of the best ones we got. Ken Van Tour from Korea, a native of Ottawa, has a question about, uh, I forgot what it was. Oh yeah, where did your rhythm style evolve? Well, I started out uh, the time of my life, the music was popular in the harder rock and heavy metal stuff was Kiss and you know ACDC and that. And for the rhythm stuff, I started getting into rock and hard rock and sort of the heavy metal styles. Then Malcolm Young, Rudolf Schenker, uh, and Eddie Van Halen were, not all of them, but three of the, the best ones for me to teach me how to play rhythm guitar. Um, everybody knows Eddie Van Halen was uh, you know, the most groundbreaking lead player and uh, amazing songwriter, but he was also one of the best rhythm guitar players, along with Malcolm Young, who a lot of people say, wow, three chords, or a lot of people have said in the past, but that ACDC was so simple, but I think that's, it's a consensus in the industry and through musicians and the recording industry that ACDC are probably one of the most difficult bands to, to perform their music perfectly. Uh, Malcolm Young is just a genius at, at uh, his preciseness, if that's a word. Um, yeah, lots of other. Rudolf Schenker was a great rhythm player, is lots of other guys. Then I got into the thrash, heavier music. And then you have the, uh, the genius pickers and rhythm players like James Hetfield, Kerry King, Jeff Hanneman, Gary Holt from Exodus. You've got just some, James Hetfield, of course. Incredible start and stop and speed picking from those guys. So I combined old school stuff with the new thrashy stuff and that's Waters. Cesar from Portugal has a ton of questions. I'm gonna try to get a few in here because they're pretty cool. Uh, what studio gear do I feel is essential these days? Um, I don't know, as far as the studio end, as long as you have a good sound going into your system, which is usually computer based now, uh, as long as the sound going in is good, 
then uh, you've done your best and it's only up to how you put it together later when it's all in your computer. So things called converters and preamps and compressors are in microphone cables and microphones and performance, strings, picks, pickups, everything. It's all uh, crucial. But now these days the equipment is so good that if your sound going into the computer or the recording system is good, then the sky's the limit. You can usually make it sound great if you have the money and a person with the experience to put it together for you. Uh, Cesar's other question is, um, whether it's from an amp or pedal, what is your all-time favorite distortion? Uh, I think from my aspect, from studio perspective is, um, like I have my own distortion pedal out called the Devil Drive, but I also like the uh, early Japanese versions of the Boss Overdrive, the OD-1 pedal, and uh, that was partially kind of modeled with my pedal. Um, but uh, I don't know, tube distortion from the amps, the preamp and the amp, loud, quiet, overdrive pedals, distortion pedals. You can usually get good sounds from everything if you, you, you get the right combinations. Spencer Barton from Canada says, uh, how did Annihilator get going and how long did it take you to perfect your guitar playing? Uh, Annihilator started late 84, right here in Ottawa, very close to where I'm standing actually. Uh, with a friend of mine, John Bates, and he and I were a total Slayer, Venom, Alice Cooper, everything, you know, fans of theatrical stuff, like Rocky Horror Picture Show meets Slayer, you know, all that kind of stuff. We liked uh, heavy and strange music. Um, I was getting out of my uh, heavy metal phase and getting more into the thrashier and more theatrical, dramatic kind of styles of music. But... Um, John Bates and I just said, let's put something together that's like Alice Cooper meets heavy metal, thrash metal, which is, if you take the song Alice in Hell, that is pretty much what it is. Horror films meets heavy metal meets, you know, an Alice Cooper kind of strange, fun vibe. Uh, and that's how we started. We did a, a demo here in Ottawa, got a few guys together, but it was difficult to keep people together and, and focus that wanted to really do this full time and get really good at what we were doing. Uh, people just, a lot of guys just wanted to go out to the bars and party and hang out with their girlfriends and drink beer, which is great, but I wanted to do the work first uh, and then enjoy things later. But, uh, so I moved out to Vancouver and that's kind of where Annihilator really got started and going and uh, the first album came out while we were in Vancouver and there you go. That's the beginnings. We did some demos, blah, 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 just like most other bands. Daniel from Germany asks, what is the most challenging guitar riff to play with Annihilator uh, on stage, live? Well, challenging guitar riffs on stage, I would say sometimes it's deceiving. We could play a very simple song like Alice in Hell. A lot of people say, oh, that's one of the only songs I can really play from Annihilator's Alice in Hell album. Uh, but it's uh, for the band and myself, that's one of the most difficult songs to play because there's a lot of time changes and feel changes. It's not to a click track, it's not like a robot, it's, it's a feel thing. And we have probably never played that perfectly live ever uh, as a band in any of the lineups or any of the history, so that's a difficult one to play. And sometimes the technical ones are easier. The faster ones can actually be easier because there's less time for your ear to hear the mistakes. When you go really fast, you might not hear the little mistakes in timing or missed notes, whereas if you're going slow, and you have to be perfect timing, and it's very clear what you're doing, that can, can uh, be difficult. Troy Smith from Canada asks if I could tour with any other band. Uh, he says double bill, but just tour with any other band. Um, well, uh, clearly the band on my shirt, Van Halen, would be amazing. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I have a list of 100 different bands I love from Exciter, Anvil, Razor from the early days to the Priest, Scorpions, Maiden, Metallica, Exodus, you just go on forever and ever. Venom, I mean, I could go forever. So any of those bands would be a dream to play with. Luckily, after many years of touring and around the world, we've played with a lot of those bands. So I'm a lucky guy, lucky Ottawa kid. And from Australia, Sebastiano Condo has a question that I think is pretty cool. What was the inspiration for our 1994-95 King of the Kill record? Um, and that was an interesting time because we just had very, three very successful records. Uh, Alice in Hell, Never Never Land, Set the World on Fire. And, but after Set the World on Fire, despite it being quite successful everywhere in the world, it, we were dropped from the label and the label dropped almost all its other heavy metal, thrash metal, death metal bands. Um, and 
so did most other labels. It just became not cool to have metal on your label, especially in North America. So I kind of thought my career was over as Annihilator. Um, and my co-writing part, lyric partner, John Bates, who I started the band with, had just relocated out to Vancouver uh, the year before and convinced me that I should sing on my demos um, and maybe on a record because he thought that my voice was pretty good. And I was like, well, okay, sure. So I sang on the King of the Kill demos, realized that it was okay, shopped the, the demo and was very amazed to, to, to get a couple of big record deals. And that was amazing to me because I, I didn't really like my voice and I knew I was not a, a great singer. Um, I thought I was good enough for demos. So I didn't think I'd be great on a record, but my opinion still is the same, but uh, the Japanese people picked it up and it was uh, ridiculously at number one and two with Bon Jovi, Lay You Down on a Bed of Roses. You know, it was on the charts with that kind of music and it was very cool to see a culture not care about styles of music and just go with what they liked. Um, and that spread to Europe and King of the Kill was one of our biggest tours and biggest albums. Um, and that's it. We only released in Japan and, and uh, North America, or Japan and Europe for that record at that time. And it became a big record for us and uh, gave me a career in uh, music after that. So it was a very lucky and fortunate time. Costas from Greece asks, uh, what, what are my favorite memories from playing in Greece? Well, I, three, uh, lamb, potatoes, and amazing metal musicians. I mean, the best of all three there. Uh, but yeah, obviously Greece is a beautiful country, a lot of history, but the metal fans there are, uh, you know, all you have to do is go on YouTube and take a look at any metal band that plays there and watch the reaction from the fans. Uh, so many good countries and great fans around the world, but Greece is up there in the top five for sure, maybe top three. Um, and it's always been an honor to play there and we're actually, I don't know what date this comes out, but we're going to be playing there uh, pretty soon. Andreas from Norway uh, has a question about which bands or albums do I think might be uh, an inspira uh, inspiration to other people that maybe they haven't heard these records or bands that inspired me in some way. Um, and sure, you may have heard these bands or heard these records, but I'll give you mine. Um, I would say a band from the States called Riot. They had a record called Fire Down Under many years ago. Swords and Tequila, Altar of the Kings. They had so many great songs. Outlaw, uh, that was an inspirational one for me. Whether it actually really inspired Annihilator songs or not, it was just an amazing record. A lot of people know Anvil's second record, uh, Metal on Metal, from the song and the movie. Uh, but uh, Anvil's first record called Hard and Heavy was a very unique cross between hard rock, rock and roll, and uh, with brackets around that Ted Nugent meets the beginnings of metal. So the Hard and Heavy record from Anvil was an incredible record. Um, Sweet, a band from the UK, inspired uh, most every band, whether we know it or not, in everything from pop music to hard rock to metal. They had an album called Desolation Boulevard, which was a, a classic, where I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the songs are written by uh, Chapman Chin, uh, by some famous songwriters like Fox on the Run, uh, Ballroom Blitz, but they also let the band write some songs, uh, like Into the Night and Sweet F.A. and uh, Set Me Free. I think Testament covered one of those songs. I wanted to cover the song that Testament did, but by the time I tried to do it, I realized Testament did a great version of it, so I didn't do it. Uh, but Desolation Boulevard by Sweet is a really important record for music. Um, other than that, all the first three albums by Razor, Anvil, Exciter, Classics, Canadians, of course. Um, there's so many good ones out there. Brad Ion from New Zealand asks what advice I would give to aspiring metal musicians, and uh, how long have I been into audio engineering? Advice that could go on forever, but you know, no matter what I say, everything works differently for different people. The main ones I'd say, I would say though, are, is if you're into metal, listen to many different styles of music. Don't just listen to metal, and if, but if that's all you're doing, listen to a bunch of different styles of metal. Metal music encompasses everything from blues to classical to jazz to angry music to fun music punk, everything. So you can cover most kinds of music and inspirations just within the term heavy metal. Um, listen to a lot of guitar players, listen to a lot of drummers, learn how to, if you're a guitar player, learn how to program a drum machine, learn how to record on your computer or, or in some way. Uh, grab a bass guitar and even if you can't play it well or don't care about it, 
put down a simple bass line, learn how your guitar riffs and songwriting are going to match or match up or fit with the other people's instruments if you don't have a band with you right now. Audio engineering I kind of dropped into uh, as a kid when I was doing my first demo for the Annihilator demos. Um, and even before that, I borrowed a friend uh, four-track Fostex cassette recorder didn't know how to use it, but I wanted to write riffs, and then I wanted a drum on there, a drummer, and then a bass guitar. So I kind of learned on my own how the concept works. Then there was a lot of, we didn't have internet then, so there was a lot of magazines about audio recording in the stores, and you would spend a lot of money, five or ten dollars at the time, to buy the magazines, but there would be twenty come out every month. I would spend thousands of dollars in my uh, teenage life recording, or sorry, buying recording magazines, and that's kind of how it worked. Then I got into good studios, learned from a lot of good engineers and producers and mixers and mastering engineers and just love it as a hobby. And when times are tough for Annihilator and the metal business in the 90s, I just learned to do that stuff on my own. It's out of uh, necessity. I love it. It's a hobby, but I love doing it. Thank you. I'm just happy to be here. Every memory is amazing. You know, I grew up my whole life trying to get the hell out of my parents' basement and play guitar. You know, uh, every single day I went home when people were partying in high school and invited me to go out and party, I was writing it off and thinking about maybe I'll be able to party in about 10 years when I'm good enough at guitar, you know, to, to do this for a living. And uh, I never, ever, ever, ever take this life for granted because there's so many people who want to be playing music and so many people who who can and I'm, I'm just thankful that I was able to work my ass off enough to get to where we are right now. Thanks to everyone who comes to Annihilator shows, comes to see us, um, puts your hard-earned money into seeing the band. Um, we love playing the music for you and hope to do it a lot more. Man, I love Jeff, I love the band, I love his playing, his compositions are terrific. I wish more musicians would be like Jeff who is, uh, yeah, somebody who you like to watch or you like to hear. Mr. Waters, well done. We still love Shop you. Shop hole. Very good. Annihilator, uh, one of my probably top 30 favorite bands of all time and will continue to be with each and every release. Uh, so set the world on fire! Annihilator rules. Uh, a friend of mine. Oh, shit. 2004 was a record. Fuck you. Do that again. We rehearsed at Jeff's house, which is uh, in the Canada. Uh, where are we? Uh, he got Dave Steele and I uh, to work on. We can help. What was that first song? <laughs> <laughs> It gave us a chance to do things differently, to get some dynamics going. Hello, monkey. Um, recording that we have for this DVD. All good? You looked very like something was wrong there, so I had to stop. <laughs> <laughs>